Hey, sweetie, who's your favorite saxophone player? You. Me? Yeah. Yeah, but you must like someone else other than Daddy. King Curtis, King Curtis! <laughs> you like King Curtis? But you're my favorite saxophone player! Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi friends, I'm the Saxophone Oracle. This week we're doing something a little bit different. As I begin to hear from you viewers out there, I've noticed that many of you are curious to know a little bit more about the enigma that is the Saxophone Oracle. Uh, it seems you're curious to know a little bit more about me, my influences, where I come from, musical preferences, saxophone players I like. So this week I'm gonna bring you my personal top 10 list of my favorite saxophone players of all time. While putting this list together, I very quickly started seeing similarities between all of these musicians. And I suppose that's not surprising, but I think it's telling as to my personal aesthetics, the things I value in music. So I thought it'd be interesting to point out some of these similarities before we go into the individual musicians, what I like about them and how they've influenced me. For starters, they all happen to be jazz musicians. And believe me, I like me some rock and roll saxophone and I like smooth jazz sax as much as the next guy. But these 10 musicians all happen to be jazz musicians. They all happen to be highly individual sounding. They have really unique, instantly recognizable tones. Um, and speaking of tone, I would say they're all on the darker side of the spectrum. So if we put the barometer for brightness over here, we'll say David Sanborn, Michael Brecker. All of these players are from the middle. That way, I noticed. All these players have a highly individual sense of time, and by that I mean not only where and how they place their notes, but also how they articulate, how they tongue, and where they choose to emphasize their phrases. It's quite interesting. They all also come from either a bebop or blues background, in many cases both. I would say overall they're all highly melodic and lyrical players, and they play almost, I'd say, with a sense of restraint in many cases, but purpose and intention. There's nothing superfluous about any of these, the way any of these people play. So they're not fat, flashy players, they're not gimmicky in any way. They're just all about serving the music. And while many of them have unbelievable technique, the technique is there to serve the musical idea, not, not to show off. Interestingly, all of these players come from a certain era of jazz too, I guess a classic era. And by that I simply mean, I guess, from 1940 to 1960. So while they're all of different generations and different ages, at some point in that 20 year span, all of these players figured prominently in the music scene. And I guess the last thing I would say, because the saxophone oracle is a romantic, I'm a sap at heart, each and every one of these players are impeccable interpreters of ballads, because I love a love song played well. So that is of course the great Johnny Hodges. I would describe him as probably one of the most unique alto saxophonists I've ever heard. He was of course best known for being the lead alto player in the Ellington band. He had his own groups, but Ellington would be his claim to fame. Um, if I had to describe his sound, certainly it would be lush and um, <laughs> I suppose in a, really, in a really good way, unbearably sweet. He had, had such a sweet, beautiful, beautiful sound. He has a signature vibrato. I talked about him in my uh, vibrato video that I've done. You know, it's wide, fast. He used all kinds of interesting techniques to color his playing. 
pitch bending, smearing notes, glissandos. He had impeccable phrasing. Of course, being the lead of that section, he, he defined the saxophone section sound of the Ellington band. And he had incredible control of the instrument. Um, he could play the entire dynamic range. He could play a pianissimo that was so beautiful, yet ring so clear over the entire section or over the, the entire band for that matter. And I think that's really interesting because when we think about saxophone, other than maybe on the classical side of things, jazz, popular music, all that, there's two volumes, right? There's loud and then there's extremely loud. And uh, Johnny Hodges did it all. He wasn't afraid to play quiet, quiet as possible. And, and believe me, he grabbed your attention when he did so. The only thing else I would say is, I mean, everything he played was so smooth and so sophisticated and so elegant. He was just such an elegant musician. <laughs> How about that? That is the great Pepper Adams. He is the only baritone saxophone player on my top 10 list. What can I say about Pepper Adams? Um, he completely revolutionized the instrument. He completely changed the sound concept of the baritone saxophone and its role in music. He made it a soloistic instrument. He brought it to the front line, just like a tenor sax, alto sax, or trumpet. I mean, let's face it, before that, it was kind of a novelty instrument. It was in the saxophone section, it filled a role. I mean, there was, of course, Jerry Mulligan was a famous baritone saxophone soloist at the time, but you know, his whole concept, his sound concept was really soft and restrained. In general, baritone sax sound was generally kind of stuffy and mushy, and to me it was just kind of a lazy, boring sounding instrument until Pepper came along. He brought this energy, this ferocity, this edge to the tone and this presence. He had a metronomic time feel, razor sharp articulation, which is, which is key because he brought so much clarity to this instrument that plays so low. And so when he played from the lowest end of the saxophone to the top, there was this precise clarity. You could hear everything. It's just wonderful. And of course, he developed his own vocabulary and, and his own language in many ways. Um, I would best describe Pepper Adams as extremely committed to the awesome power that is the diminished scale. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Um, he milked that scale, those eighth notes, to death, and uh, he coupled it with a lot of great intervallic stuff, perfect uh, intervals, but I love Pepper Adams, and he's the reason why I started playing baritone saxophone. <laughs> Parker. What could I possibly say that hasn't already been said about Charlie Parker? I mean, he's undoubtedly the greatest saxophonist in history and probably forevermore will be the greatest saxophone player. Uh, on top of that, him and all of his buddies invented bebop, which changed the shape of jazz and, and most of modern music. Uh, I, the only person I could think of who's maybe more influential than Bird would be, of course, Louis Armstrong. But uh, look, Charlie Parker's been gone for almost 70 years now, and uh, his music is as relevant today as it ever was. I mean, you can't find me a player on the scene today or going back who, who's, who even touches Charlie Parker, except for maybe John Coltrane. I mean, Bird is timeless. It's, it's perfection. I, I, I love it. Enough said. <laughs> Thank you. 
Cannonball Adderley. I mean, what a player. What a sound. It's so dark, yet with edge, the phrasing, the way he articulates. If you ever spend the time transcribing Cannonball and really getting into the nitty gritty of how he's doing things and playing, you have to check out his articulation. It's out of this world. It's nothing what you'd expect. It's, it's all over the place where he accents things. It, it's so cool. And you hear it, like his time feel is so bouncy. And he's such, there's so much joy in his playing. He's, he's like the most joyous. He always puts a smile on his face. Even if he's playing the saddest song, it'll put a smile on my face. The only other player I can think of that does that, for me anyway, is Sonny Rollins. Interestingly, Cannonball, a lot of people refer to him as the next extension of Charlie Parker. In a lot of ways I can see it, but in a lot of ways I don't. I don't really see Cannonball coming from bebop so much. He's heavily blues influenced, heavily from the church. He does play all those lines and things, but his note choices, it's not, it's not really what Bird's doing. It's pretty funky and interesting. He makes a lot of weird choices. It's, he's a really, really interesting player. I mean, and then technically, forget about it. I mean, people always point to like Michael Brecker or Chris Potter in terms of the greatest technique ever. But I mean, for my money, can ball utterly hands down. I just forget about it. Monstrous. That is Don Bias. I love Don Bias. He had such an enormous sound. I, I can hear when I listen to the recordings that the recordings can't do it justice. It's like they can't handle the amount of, of sound he had. And for me, he was really the bridge between bebop and what came before. I guess you'd call it swing era. Um, a lot of people talk about Dexter Gordon, Dexter Gordon kind of playing that role. Some people refer to Coleman Hawkins in that way. But for me, I really think it's Don Bias. He had one foot firmly planted in each, in each era of music, and, and it just created such a unique way of playing. He's such a great player, and I think he's so underrated. He's one of the many musicians who decided to spend their careers in Europe, obviously trying to uh, escape or get some relief from the racism that, that was America, certainly at that time. I'm, I'm sure it was no picnic in Europe either, but it must have been must have been better than in the States. And and I think a lot of those musicians took a big career hit, obviously, because of it, because they, they weren't in the States, so they weren't getting the same kind of media attention. We didn't have YouTube or Spotify or, or satellite radio. But uh, I think he's really underappreciated. I, I really encourage you to check out Don Bias. <laughs> Sonny Stitt. I love Sonny Stitt for so many reasons. What an impeccable, impressive musician. Unfortunately, he was always labeled for some reason as a Charlie Parker clone, which I never got, because if you listen to them together, of course they're different. Sure, there are similarities, but who, who at the same time as Charlie Parker, who came after Charlie Parker, doesn't have a ton of bird in their playing. So I don't know what these critics were talking about. I don't think they were qualified. To, you know, Who's a critic? They can't play an instrument. It's not like... Dizzy Gillespie was writing the record reviews, and then at least you have someone credible calling him a clone. No, it's, it's people who don't know anything. Um, so it's unfortunate, but uh, look, musicians know. Sonny Stitt is legit. He's amazing. And he had a completely different melodic concept. If you ever transcribe his solos, they're, they're unbelievable works of art. They're, they're almost like perfect little etudes. Uh, a master of voice leading. There's never a note out of place, never an unnecessary passing tone. He never works himself into a weird corner harmonically. And he was consistently like that his entire career. Just an amazing tour de force. And what I 
especially loved about him and what influenced me a lot was that he played both alto and tenor equally beautifully. But he had a different sound concept, in my opinion, on both instruments. So his alto sound was a little more bright with a little more edge. I found his tenor sound to be a lot more rounder and darker. And that kind of gave me the permission to start thinking about saxophone in a different way. I grew up playing tenor sax. I never liked the way I played alto, but I always approached the alto the way I played my tenor. And then listening to Stitt and really getting into Sonny Stitt, I was like, okay, I can approach alto as a different instrument almost altogether and baritone the same way. And then that really brought joy and I started playing alto saxophone, finally, because I love it. I, until I was 30 years old, I didn't touch an alto saxophone hardly ever. So I'm, I'm really grateful to that influence he had on me. I love Sonny Stitt. <laughs> That's Ben Webster, and just for me, wow, he, he just pulls my heartstrings. Big, beautiful, warm sound, unmistakable sound, unmistakable vibrato. I talked about him as well in the video I did about vibrato. He does this really cool thing where when he tapers off his phrases, he lets the note die away, yet he continues putting air through the horn and he continues the vibrato, and it's such a beautiful, interesting effect. I just, I love his playing, and, and he, I discovered him when I was in high school. I used to go to the library every few weeks and take out cassette tapes and CDs. And I was always listening to either, you know, people like Miles Davis or, or Coltrane or Oscar Peterson, stuff my teachers were telling me about. Otherwise, I was interested in, like, like most of you probably, uh, faster, higher, louder. I loved like big band music and all the impressive stuff, you know, uh, Arturo Sandoval or Michael Brecker, you know, and I'd be intensely listening to Eric Marianne's all shred in the GRP big band. And then I put in this cassette of Ben Webster and I heard Chelsea Bridge, that, that song, and it just, I was, I was taken. It, it grabbed a hold of me and I think Ben Webster is really responsible for me starting to look more at the history of music, looking deeper in, into the beauty and, and less off the surface of the high, fast, loud, flashy. I just love Ben Webster. I could listen to him play any song all day long. It's magic. <laughs> Sonny Rollins, the best. I mean, tenor saxophone, look, unique in every way. The way he plays, the way he thinks, the way he talks, the way he speaks, the way he does his hair. Incredible sound. For me, he experimented a ton. His sound changed over the years. But for me, the be-all, end-all of tenor saxophone sound is Sonny Rollins in his 1950s period, really young Sonny Rollins, when he was playing with Miles Davis, Clifford Brown, Fats Navarro. Uh, you know, his Tenor Madness records, Saxophone Colossus, that tone you cannot beat. One interesting thing Sonny Rollins does is he tongues virtually every note. Um, even when it doesn't sound like it, he's probably tonguing very softly in there. And, unless, of course, it's a blistering tempo, but uh, as we hear there, he's still punctuating and accenting and marking things. Unbelievable time feel, this sense of buoyancy. When we talked about Cannibal Adderley, I mentioned Sonny. And, and just the, the sheer joy you hear in his playing, even if it's the saddest song, it, it, it feels so happy because 
because Sonny is there. It's, it's pure love when he plays. I would describe him, uh, very few musicians, he'd be one of them as a pure improviser. He's a magician. I did a video about what I think is the most difficult song in jazz to play. I talked a lot about Sonny Rollins in that video and how like he can take he can, he can make magic out of nothing. You give him one chord or two chords and you put a polka band behind him. I will be on the floor in the front row, jaw on the floor, saying, well, I guess I like polka music now. You know, Thanks, Sonny. Um, no matter the song he's playing, it always sounds like he either wrote it or someone wrote it for him. I, th there's, I can't say enough good things about Sonny Rollins. He's just incredible. Also, of this list of 10 players, He's the only one who's still with us, and thankfully, unfortunately, he can't play anymore. Um, but but thankfully, Sonny's still with us, and I, I feel so fortunate, blessed even, that I've had the chance to hear him play on more than one occasion, because all my other heroes on this list, anyway, were were, were passed on long before I was born or before I even knew what a saxophone was. So it's meant the world to me to be able to experience his playing live to be able to shake his hand, meet him briefly, take a picture. It's just, uh, I, I love Sonny Rollins. That was Hank Mobley. What a beautiful player. Uh, unfortunately, there's no known video footage of him. It's, it's, it's such a shame because he's such an incredible musician. Beautiful tone, such a lyrical player. Dark tone, rounded, less edgy than most of his contemporaries. I think generally highly underrated. I mean, amongst professional saxophone players, we all know Hank Mobley is is the man, he, heavyweight champion there. But um, I guess at the time, he, he was a little bit overshadowed. John Coltrane was so popular. Sonny Rollins, Wayne Shorter with Miles Davis's whole band. Um, but man, and what an incredible composer too. He doesn't get enough credit. He has such a list of incredible compositions, beautifully arranged. I, I can't say enough good things. I love uh, Hank Mobley. <laughs> Dexter Gordon, man, talk about class, talk about a sound, huge, dark edge to it. Um, he's such a relaxed player. He, he's known as playing behind the beat, or people say he tends to drag, but that's not always the case. He, he, he is really relaxed. Sometimes he's on top, though. Sometimes he's in the middle. But I just, I get the feeling when I listen to Dexter, it's like, don't worry, Uncle Dexter's here. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to go for a ride, just chill out. It's just the epitome of cool. Every phrase is impeccable. He uses tons of space. Again, he tongues almost each and every single note he plays. That's really interesting. Almost every single note he plays is tongued. Um, he tends to play a lot of long notes. He'll let notes linger at the end of the phrase. He'll hold the note just a little bit longer than most. And I suppose if I had such a beautiful sound, <laughs> I, would, I would be tempted to do the same thing all the time. It makes sense. Uh, he has a signature type of vibrato to his playing as well, a lot more subtle than, than the older generation. And um, I can say when I, was, when I was in high school, my friend's father 
uh, gave me a CD because he knew I was playing saxophone, and that was really influential. It was Dexter Gordon's Ballad CD, which happens to be a compilation. You can still get it. Typically, I hate compilations because they don't really make sense. You know, they're they're mishmashing things together, the different bands on different tracks or different eras of a person's career. But this ballad compilation of Dexter Gordon is just magic. It's it's one of the best CDs I've I've ever heard. I love Dexter Gordon. I am the saxophone oracle, and those are my 10 favorite saxophonists of all time. I suppose now you have a little more insight into who I am as a musician, as a person. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it entertaining. I strongly encourage you to check these mu musicians out if you're not already familiar with them. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. I'd love to hear from you. Who are your favorites? I think that'd be a great discussion to have going in the comments amongst viewers who we all like and for what reason. Thanks for continuing to watch. I wish you a great week. Happy practicing. Bye for now. We'll see you next Tuesday.